Oh, uh, hey folks, how's it going? It's your old pal, Chester the Lab right here. Listen, I've been hearing some chatter, some rumors, that Paul Zaloom, you know, that Beekman guy, is going to be on the show this week. Well, let me set the record straight, okay? It's just not happening. No way. No how. No sir. Zip. Zilch. Zero. Zaloom. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we talk about making science even more fun. With that primo puppeteer and baron of brilliance, Beekman himself, Paul Zaloom. Really? Really? You're kidding me, right? Do you have any idea of how short the average lifespan of us lab rats are? And I have to put up with this humiliation? I mean, seriously, come on, um... Ooh, 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 there's no cheese. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James G. Maynard. This week we talk about making science even more fun. We're gonna learn how we build bridges to great science learning through storytelling, entertainment, and the occasional puppet. Later in the puppets. show, we're gonna talk more about puppets. puppeteer, satirist, and actor who starred in Beekman's world, Paul Zaloom. Now, you remember that boring science teacher we all had as a kid? Yeah, yeah, that one. Blah, 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 blah. Well, we don't enjoy hearing about science that way, do we? Of course not. And those of us who teach science don't want to teach that way, do we? Of course doubly not so. Where were we? Oh, right, Isaac Newton. Now, everyone knows the story of Isaac Newton and the apple falling on his head. The trouble is, it may or may not have actually happened the way the story is told. Well, I mean, sure. Okay, there are apple trees on Newton's property at Walsthorpe Manor in England. And yes, apples fall. But was the inventor of calculus actually connected upon the noggin by a malice domestica? <laughs> Probably not. Makes a great story though, doesn't it? This popular legend may or may not literally be true, but it serves as an introduction to the idea of universal gravitation. Understanding that gravity pulls on the moon the same way a falling apple leads toward the Earth uh, leads to er learning about orbits, tides, and how falling into a black hole would make you stretch apart like this guy right here. Ah, no, I'm falling into a black hole! Ah. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Maybe? Lighthearted science shows began during the earliest days of television when only a small percentage of homes had television sets. Imagine that! The John Hopkins Science Review, hosted by Lynn Paul, interviewed scientists in a friendly, easy-to-understand format from 1948 to 55 on the Dumont Television Network. What? You never heard of Dumont? No, no, just, just go look that up. I'll, I'll. Good story. I'll wait here. In 1951, the Johns Hopkins Science Review became the first American program broadcast in Europe. Now, that same year, Watch Mr. Wizard hit the airwaves on NBC. Now, this show starring Don Herbert uh, started in Herbert's home studio in his garage and ran 14 years. Bonus points if you remember its one-year revival as, as Mr. Wizard from 1971 to 72 in Canada. 10,000 points for Wizard Doll! Eh? But most of you aren't going to remember his stint on Mr. Wizard's World broadcast from 1983 to 89 on Nickelodeon, where it became the, sh the channel's number three rated show. The start of the 1990s is known to, the, known to history mainly for the fall of the Soviet Union, the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, and the reign of Beekman's World. This show featured the incomparable Beekman in his fluorescent green lab coat assist accompanied by one of three assistants and a rat. That's that guy in a rat costume? The show premiered on the Learning Channel in 92, the same day Nick Jonas was born in Dallas. Coincidence? I think not. 
For more than five years, Beekman challenges demonstrated scientific principles with hilarious and often disgusting results. Episodes answer questions from kids in ways that only 1990s kids shows on basic cable could muster, usually with slime. That leads us to gross stuff, which is always fun to teach with, right? Next up, here's Paul, Z Paul Zaloom from Beekman's World. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello, I am AI. Hmm. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Paul Zaloom. Now, he is a puppeteer, a political satirist, that's the best type of satirist, a filmmaker, performance artist, and you know him as Beekman from one of the greatest science shows of the 90s, if not all time, Beekman's World. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I love that you are a puppeteer. How did, how did you get started in, in, with puppets and puppeteering? Uh, well, I was always interested in puppets and dolls and stuff like that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when the whole pop art thing happened and, uh, you know, the soup can, that oh, right. made me wow. really interested in the idea of... Um, foundness just the arbitrariness of finding objects so i had a found object museum in the garage when i was a kid cool because um, i've always been a museum freak too and it's always been my fantasy to have a museum so i had a little one in the garage uh just the stuff i found on the street mm -hmm. um i didn't have a lot of visitors <laughs> 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 but uh yeah and then um i I ended up going to hippie college and the bread and puppet theater was in residence there. And I ended up taking a couple of workshops and then they asked me to join. And so that's what I did for my college education. Um, just basically was a full time professional puppeteer and I graduated with a degree in puppetry, I guess. That's fabulous. And of course I, I lived in Vermont for several years, so I cannot tell you how many times I've gone to bread and puppet. And oh, where did I you just, live? Uh, Brattleboro, oh. which is southeast. So, yeah. um, but it was funny, uh, when we moved to Tucson, one of the first things we did here was bread and puppet came to Tucson. So I thought that was kind of cool. But what, tell, just go over briefly a little bit about what that seems like and what you might have learned from that. Uh, well, I learned, um, <laughs> I learned a lot, uh, you know, I joined when I was 19 and I'm 72 now and I still work there. I'm on the board, um, oh, wow. and I'm a chair of the museum committee. We have one of the, or the biggest puppet museum in the world, actually in Glover, Vermont, which yeah. I would encourage anyone who's in the neighborhood, it's get over there. And see. Yeah, it's, it's spectacular beautiful. museum. It's an yeah. old post and beam barn. One of the biggest barns actually yeah. in the region built in uh, 1860 to 1862. 
and it's filled with all of, uh, with a lot of the puppets um, from Bread and Puppet, which was founded in '63 by Elke and Peter Schumann. And Peter is kind of a neo German expressionist um, puppeteer, uh, very very much in that sort of German expressionist mode, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and very political um, and uh, really an artist's theater, uh, puppetry, contestoria, which is storytelling with pictures, which is the forerunner to film. And uh, and what else? Uh, toy theater and marionettes and, you know. Um, I love the cheap art. Yeah, and then he started the cheap art movement, which is... Yeah trying to make art accessible to everybody yeah. um, and take it off the highfalutin uh, path and put it more on a, a grassroots kind of footing. All right. So um, now Beekman's World first aired in 1992. Tell us a little bit about how the idea for that came about and how it, how the uh, show the show developed. Was, yeah, the show is based on a... Um, comic that was in over 300 newspapers called You Can with Beekman and Jacks that was created by Jock Church, who was a, um, a very interesting, intense, wonderful, queer human who lived in San Francisco. And he created the comic on a Mac, actually, and it, like I said, it was syndicated in 300 newspapers and someone got the bright idea to turn it into a TV show. Um, because the, the Congress had passed the Children's Television Act of 1991, which required local affiliate television stations that were affiliated to networks to provide us like, I think three hours of informational and or educational programming a week for children. So he got the idea, why don't we turn this comic strip? He worked for Universal Below, which owned a lot of newspapers and television stations. He said, why don't we develop this into a kid's educational show and then we can sell it uh, to our affiliates who will then have an inoculation against FCC disease. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And was there, and so the show, you know, the really mixed science with um with humor and um uh, i hate to say this but taught taught science while while having fun doing it i don't know why i hated saying that how'd that, how'd that I mean was right. that was that mainly because of the regulations or was that was that something that had science appeal to you before that as well uh the yeah i mean the idea was just to take the comic and the sort of sensibility of the comic, which the conceit was that kids would write in to Beekman and he would answer their questions. They would ask questions about science. He would answer them in the newspaper. So that was the conceit of the comic and was also the conceit of the TV show that kids would write in and then Beekman would answer their questions uh, on the TV show. And it was in, uh, I guess it was in three parts and part one and part three were like six minute long answers to the kids' questions. And then the middle part had uh, Beak Mania where uh, Beekman answered questions sort of rapid fire and there was other shtick in there. I don't even, I don't remember. <laughs> but we had a hell of a good time. It was a, just, uh, you know, my devotion, dedication is to uh, comedy. That's what I've always been interested right, in. Right, right in puppetry obviously and objects and taking information and making it entertaining and amusing so i had done on my own a show called food p-h-o-o-d where i played a food technologist in a lab coat and a chef's toque and mm -hmm. basically i had slides of various food company brochures and F, um, FDA recalls of food and regulations like how many rodents, rodent hairs you're allowed to have in, in a certain quantity of food. I mean, you're allowed to have a certain amount of rodent hairs. Right, in food right, yeah. Because, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, 
how are you going to keep rodents out of food? It's just not going to happen. So it can't go over a certain threshold. And so, and then there was food additives that would blow up in storage or that were made out of wood or, you know, whatever the hell it was. And it was quite amusing. And I just played this food technologist pitching to like a room full of people who made food, uh, you know, oh, oh, here are all these great ingredients you can get. So the people at Beekman, they were trying to cast somebody to play the part and all it could find was sitcom dads mm. uh, in Hollywood, which is kind of hilarious when you think, what with all the actors in Hollywood, they couldn't find any. Well, yeah, they looked, looked, and they really, really didn't come up with anybody. And the guy they hired uh, to direct was a guy named Jay Dubin, and he uh, super great at comedy and super great at science and very good at technology and also a super visual guy. So he saw every frame as a picture. And he has something to be composed mm. and uh, you know, a really, really amazing and great artist. And uh, the team was led by a guy named Mark Waxman, who was the executive producer, and he was also the head writer. So um, they anyway, Jay said, I know this guy in New York and we had met because we tried to pitch one of my um, found object puppet shows. I used to do puppet shows with found objects. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of the progression from uh, the pop art thing I was talking about, because I got this idea, why don't I jiggle around crap like it's puppets? And and now it's become this thing called object theater, and it's taught in schools and blah, blah, blah. It's become a thing. But right, in, right. in late 78, there really wasn't, <laughs> there weren't a lot of people doing it. I don't know if anybody was. But anyway, obviously, direct line to Marcel Duchamp, who, you know, who sort of made the whole pop thing possible. And, you know, Duchamp, the, you know, the Picasso and Matisse said about Cezanne, he's the father of us all. And I would say as a, as an object puppeteer that uh, Mr. Duchamp is the father of, of us all, or the mother actually would be more appropriate because he was also, the, you know, drag performer as um, Rose C'est la Vie. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just a nut, you know, he was just really, really great expert chess player. And I mean, Marcel Duchamp, you know, he was just the shiznit. What can I tell you? Wow. Wow. So um, anyway, so I was doing these object puppet shows and Jay had gone with me to HBO to pitch it to them to do a special. And they, they weren't interested. And then a few years passed. And then he said, I know this nut in New York and you should get in touch with him. So I sent the video of me doing this food slideshow that I described to you. Uh -huh. And I guess they were desperate and they were like, oh, yeah, this this guy's great. So they flew me out for uh, um, uh, audition and I was very excited. I didn't sleep that night. And the next day, you know, I went in there and I was wearing a lab coat and I was just playing around and things weren't going that great. But then I knocked over some water, a beaker of water, and I splashed it around and put some on like cologne and whatever the <laughs> heck I did. And that sold them because, you know, even the, these showbiz folks there, you know, they had that civilian fascination with improvisation and going with the moment. They had nothing to lose. And when you perform for years and years in a comedic center, uh, in a comedic um, form mode, you can learn how to improvise and how to just, you know, if something happens, something goes wrong. Uh, if you drop something that you turn it into a gag, you don't ignore it. You turn it into a right, joke. Right. Yes, the audience man. loves, yeah. you know, audience loves that. So uh, that's what happened. That sealed the deal and I got the job. Wow. That's so cool. And you had great fun with gross stuff. You know, I've, I've always found, you know, it, it's it's great fun to to have fun with gross science, isn't it? Well, you know, it, for kids, uh, snot and farting and you know, all that stuff is super interesting to them and hilarious. So it's a pathway, can be a pathway to teach them about science. Uh, so one of the first episodes, and actually I think my favorite, was where I go up the nose, um, uh, yeah. examine what, you know, what's the purpose of snot, which is basically a sticky substance that traps dirt and dust and uh, germs in your nose before it ends up, you know, in some place you don't want it. Uh, and so I actually went up a giant sauna tube that had snot in it and, you know, like I was an astronaut and 
and the snot worked its way into my suit, my hazmat suit. It was between my toes. And, and you know, the, they used to dump this snot on me periodically. You know, it was a big time for dumping um, slime on Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. And so the yeah. crew would think it's hilarious when they would do, dump this crap on me. And I remember <laughs> what I used to do. I learned after a while that <laughs> I got along great with the crew, but, you know, they're messing me. So I'd have it on sure. me. I that if I moved my hands and stopped very quickly, that the snot would go flying. Off. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so I would get the back. And actually, Alana Ubach, who played my assistant, female assistant, one time I got her in the eye. And you see her in the corner of the frame, and it hits her, and she goes up like this while I'm talking. She's like this and sort of. Oh, please uh, tell me they got that on camera. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's in the episode, one of the episodes. Oh, oh you have to be, yeah, yeah. Because I, I had a um, a female assistant was, um, and then there were two others who succeeded her, um, uh, Eliza Schneider and Santa Moses, and then there was a guy in a rat suit. Um, uh, his name was Lester, and that was a puppeteer actually, Mark Ritz. He was hired to do a puppet on the show, but Jay said. What do we need a puppet for? You're just going to cut to this thing and it's going to talk and make some gag or some joke that's going to be lame. I, what's the point? You just cut to the, so what? Why have it? And we used to puppet it in the pilot, but then Jay said, no, let's put a guy in a rat suit. It's much funnier. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and, the, and well, it's funnier. And plus, he can hold stuff. He can, you know, he can be on the stage and interact with us and do physical stuff. We could use him. Right. And then he and I ended up playing quite a few different characters. Mm. And uh, because I did Galileo in one of the first shows. I saw that recently. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, and the writers yeah. came to me and said, can you do any other characters or accents? And I said, yeah, pretty much, you know, whatever you throw at me, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so I, I did French and German and Yiddish and, uh, Italian and I can't remember what else. I think I played like 40 different characters in the show. And the conceit was I would introduce them and then you'd cut to the guy in science, you know, Alexander Graham Bell or, or uh, the Montgolfier brothers that Mark and I did together, the, the balloon guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you'd cut back to me and, the, and my sidekicks there would sort of look at me and they'd look off like Wait, isn't it the same guy? But it was never said. <laughs> right, right, right. I love that sort of stuff. Because the show was really inspired, from my standpoint, very strongly by uh, Soupy Sales. It wasn't mm. inspired by um, Mr. Wizard or right. any of that stuff. It was really Soupy Sales, um, who was a really great kids entertainer when I was a kid. And became extremely popular with adults, as our show did as well. And uh, and Soupy was great. He was really, really great. So yeah, well, things like Ray, the class. hand that comes in from the side, the assistant, that's like basically based on Soupy's uh, white fang and Bluetooth, which were these furry arms that would come from the edge of the frame, and they would, you know, they would talk to him. And then Soupy would translate. Oh, so you you know you went to Chicago last week. That's not, you know. And then it would right, be right, yeah, end yeah. up with some sort of joke. Sure, sure. And it would the thing would go all over his face, and it would hit him with pies, and and then the door would knock, and he'd be like, well, "What is that?" And he'd run back, and he'd open the door, which was in the back of the set, and then he would look to like camera right, and then you would cut to an old film that was from his POV, some mm -hmm. science film, you know, some dumb gag. Right, right. He played a lot to the crew. So his eye line a lot of time was the crew, which was like eight guys in this room in, in Queens somewhere mm -hmm. or in Manhattan, who knows. And he would try to get them to laugh, you know, which is a great, I, I mean, he did it in an extreme way because no one had ever done that before in television where they play to the crew, where their eye line would be where the audience can't see. So there's something mysterious and sort of magical about that. That's so cool. Yeah, we didn't do that on our show. Uh, but I, it is an interesting trick for a live performer 
especially when you're doing a run of a show in a theater, yeah. to just play to the crew. Just say to yourself, I want to make the crew laugh. <laughs> the mm. guy in the booth. I'm doing this show for him. I want to make him laugh. So that gives you a certain license to improvise. Right. You know what I mean? It's just a trick. Right, right, right. And we just had a great time on the crew. We had a lot of laughs. The set was open. Anybody uh, in the lot could just walk in or walk out, which is not that common in Hollywood. The only time the set was closed was when we had a lion on the set. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. And they closed the set. And the lion was behind me and then I then there's me and then in front of me is a camera and behind the camera there's a guy a trainer with like a five pound steak on a stick and he's he's moving it back and forth over the camera and the lion behind me is going like this you know, watching the steak right, and right, you know right. I'm between the lion and the steak <laughs> that's not a good place to be Paul yeah yeah it was uh well, I was between this lion and his dinner. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty anxious to get that shot done. We didn't do more than a couple of takes of each shot. <laughs> One take wonder, no matter what happens. <laughs> yeah, we had an elephant on the set, and that was that was amazing. Elephant was incredible. Wow. Just to be in that close proximity to an animal like that was just incredible. And then they, the trainer, when we take a break, the trainer would take elephant out into the street in the lot and he would guide the elephant over these big metal grates that went to the sewer mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the elephant got over the grate it would urinate and then poop. and these you know because the elephant is smart it knows no this is where i'm supposed to go over the grate and it would drop these basketball sized turds like huge <laughs> turds amazing <laughs> yeah yeah i've actually seen that up close once uh, it's it's impressive. <laughs> uh, and so, tell us a little bit about what you're what you're doing now, and what's what's got your fires lit. Well, um, Beekman turns out to be extremely popular in Latin America, um, way more popular than in the states. In the states, it was kind of a niche thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And then we had fans, but it couldn't compare to Power Rangers or. Or any of that uh but in latin america the show is a huge phenomenon and i didn't find out till i went down there and uh i played at um unam well i played in brazil first and then unam the big university in mexico city mm -hmm. and the audience was like six thousand people or something i mean i had no That's idea I, I got i got home and i, I told all my friends beekman's huge in mexico I, I, you know it's like a, I needed 20 security people to get in and out of the, the venue. And they're all like, uh-huh. Sure. sure Paul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nobody really believed me. Uh, so it's been great going down there and doing live shows. And uh, I do that occasionally. Um, the pandemic kind of knocked the feet out from under that whole business. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still go back occasionally. And I love it there. Mexico is amazing. And the folks are fantastic. Brazil is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I do that occasionally. And then I'm also making movies in the garage um, where I've set up a studio. And I got an idea one night. Like I had, it was Christmas time. I had a bunch of Santa Claus tchotchkes around from my mom mm -hmm. uh, from the 50s and 60s. And I thought, gosh, you know, I could make a movie with those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could have a close up of one and then a two shot with another and a wide shot. You could Over use figures. Yeah. Yeah. You could use different figures in each shot of Santa Claus and everyone would still know who it was. Right, right. right. And there aren't a lot of characters like that. You know, maybe Elvis and um, Jesus and I don't know who else. And so that I got together like a couple of hundred Santa Clauses and then started writing scripts and we've made i don't know eight or something of these things and they're on youtube and they're between two and a half minute and six minutes long and they're comedic and they're political satire and they're really fun to make yeah absolutely and finally the saloon name in puppeteering is gonna live well beyond you isn't it you're 
your daughter and two granddaughters are puppeteers as well, as I understand. Well, they were in a bread and puppet circus one year. So I, I do uh, proudly boast sometimes that there's three generations of my family uh, yeah. that have been in the bread and puppet shows, but they're, they're not uh, showbiz bound. That's not their, uh, their particular uh, cross to bear in this lifetime. <laughs> I mean, it's been, I, I shouldn't say across the bear, it's been great. You know, I i have made a living as an artist for all these years, which is, I um, can't quite believe I got away with that. Um, and uh, it, I've had a very blessed life. I've made like, I don't know, 16 solo shores. I've toured all over the world. And uh, I've been very lucky and very fortunate. You know, I was born into a considerable amount of privilege. So that made it quite a lot easier than it would be for, other folks because of that privilege and you know, I recognize that but it's been one hell of a life you know and I, I hope it continues for another um, 72 years excellent as do we all well thanks so much for being on the show Paul it was fabulous talking with you oh well thank you thanks so much thanks yeah. for having me yeah and that was uh, Paul Zaloom puppeteer extraordinaire and the, and the uh, act behind Beekman Chemistry isn't only about developing horrible forever chemicals and blowing up underground bunkers. Oh no, it can, it can also be a lot more fun as well. There are science kits all over teaching you a magical ways of teaching chemistry. Some home science experiments use food as ingredients and can even occasionally produce edible products. Make sure everything is edible before you eat the end products or ingredients from any chemistry experiment. Liars. Am I right? Now, despite what some comic books would lead you to believe, your chances of getting sick or dying from eating random chemicals are actually much greater than your chances of obtaining superpowers. And who doesn't love some astronomy? Am I right? All over the world, amateur astronomers hold star parties, welcoming the public to use their telescopes for a tour across the universe. Look for star parties near your home, many are held by universities, local astronomy clubs, or your friendly neighborhood science and nature store. They are usually free or offered on a donation basis. Older and more experienced learners can even take part in real-world science and real-world research with real-world scientists. It's true! Scientists often need science research done by ordinary people and hundreds of thousands of people answer the call across astronomy, biology, arts, history, and more. Some even map squirrels. Look, anyone could be a squirrel mapper and here we are worrying about credit reports. Squirrel mappers everywhere should know that we're on vacation next week. Possibly mapping squirrels. Quit it already. The following week, we have a really big nut to crack. Stop it. Big show. A really big show. A really big, big, big show. Get on with it. All about ice giants. Wrong type of ice giant. <laughs> Chilling with the Ice Giants, Tales from the Frosty Frontiers premieres on the 16th of March with Cosm on the Cosmic Companion. We're going to be talking with Yoni Brandy, doctoral student at the University of Kansas, who studies these giant worlds and other solar systems. Subscribe, follow, share the show with your friends. Come on, I only told you about squirrel mapping. It's only fair. Clear skies. Yeah. Um, um, needed more puppets? Puppets.